Heavenly Father, we stand before you. We honor your word. We thank you. Your word is the truth. We receive it this night. Written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will take hold of it, be hearers and doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. You would. We're sharing with you a series of messages on the subject of the end time, mighty, perfected, glorious church. And we've been going through the New Testament, looking at each one of the, the letters now at this point and the different places where it discusses so many things that are important for us to be a part of this end time, mighty, glorious, perfected church. And tonight we're going to talk from the book of James. The book of James tells us many things that are important, that are necessary for us to be a part of this mighty end time church. We begin in verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. When it talks about this, this counting, this really means that you are to know and you're to consider and regard with all joy when you, when it says fall into diverse temptations, fall's not a really a good word here. It is a word which means to encounter or be involved in or experience according to Freiburg's lexicon. Or as Lau Nida brings it out, if you run into. And Thayer's electrons, electra, lexicon says be encompassed about. So we're not talking about that you fell into it. We're talking about that these temptations have come against you. You might encounter them or experience them or run into them or be encompassed about by them because God wants you to overcome. He doesn't want you to be overtaken by temptations whatsoever. And you need to count it all joy and rejoice when anything comes at you and not be moved by it. We see in verse 3, you need to know this, knowing this, that the trine of your faith, well, you got to know the enemy is attacking your faith. He's trying your faith, trying to get you out of faith and trying to give you, get you to give place to temptation so you'll sin <clears throat> and allow him to work against you. The trying of your faith worketh patience. The word worketh, this is a word which really means to, to accomplish, to perform, to achieve, to bring something about in other words, when a test of your faith happens, it's going to bring into operation or accomplish, achieve, achieve something in your life, which is what? Patience. Patience is the Greek word hupomone, which means steadfastness. And remember, we've talked about this. Patience is referring to a steadfastness in the soul realm. We know this, as we've seen this in the past, but we'll show you again. Luke chapter 21, verse 19, says, In your patience, same Greek word, hupomone, possess your souls. So it's talking about you keeping things in order in the soulless realm, which is your will and like the emotions. By the way, you're here for the first time. We point out information in the lower window. It brings information about the particular Greek or Hebrew words and information that we to give you about that, and we explain it as we go. So here we see the trying of our faith. It's the devil trying to get you out of faith. Will work, accomplish, bring about steadfastness in your life. And that is so important, steadfast in the soul, because where's the battleground with the enemy? It's in the soulish realm, coming against your mind, coming against your will, coming through your emotions, trying to get you out of the spirit and not walk in the ways of the Word of God. He goes on in verse 4, But let patience, hupomone, or steadfastness, have her perfect work, her perfecting work. So you remember we're talking about you becoming mighty, becoming a part of this glorious, perfected church. You let steadfastness have its perfecting work, that you may be perfect, and entire, or this means complete, wanting or lacking nothing. Because what does God want? He wants you to be perfect. He wants us to go on to perfection, as we have talked about. And when he talks about, if you will let patience have its perfect work, then you may be, if you let that happen. This is a present tense verb, meaning ongoing action. 
A subjunctive mood, though, meaning it's a conditional statement. The subjunctive mood is important whenever we see it in the Greek because it's talking about a conditional statement, not that it's automatic. That you may be, if you meet the conditions of what? Being steadfast in the midst of a trial. You might be perfect and complete, this means, lacking nothing. That's what God wants. He wants us to overcome every temptation. He goes on in verse 5 and says, if any of you are lacking wisdom, meaning you're not, you don't have wisdom about what's going on in this attack that's coming against you, what's the answer? Well, you go and, and ask of God, which is the word aiteo, which means a demand of something do you. Remember this word is a word, number 154. If you look here, this is out of Strong's Concordance. A demand of something due is what it means. So, what are we going to do? We're going to, this is number 154 again, I tell you, we're going to make a demand of something due of God. Now, why are we doing that? Because it's a promise. In the New Testament, the promises have been given to us. This is why we don't request and ask him. He's already given them to us. We make a legal demand of what's due us by bringing the scripture promise and taking hold of it with thanksgiving. So wisdom is a promise. And if we don't have wisdom in a situation, what do we do? We come and we make a demand of God that gives to all men liberally and abradeth. He's not holding back whatsoever. He, uh, he didn't revile us at all. It shall be given unto us. In other words, God will give you wisdom in whatever the situation is to know what to do in that situation. See, God will always show you. You may not have the wisdom initially when the attack comes, but he will give you wisdom. Now, as you're approaching him for this, we always have to be doing this in faith. That's the only way you're going to receive from the Lord. Let him ask, I tell you, make a demand of what's due you, in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth, he's like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. If we're wavering, that means we're really not... Uh, set on receiving that from the Lord. Wavering, we're tossed to and fro. That means you might be doubting, you might be wondering, you, you might be affected by the temptation instead of looking to God to give you the wisdom. No. We're going to ask in, or, or make our demand in faith. Notice what he says. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Talking about receiving a promise, which is receiving wisdom. Don't think that you're going to be able to receive lambano, which means to take or take hold of anything of the Lord if we are wavering. That means we give place to the temptation. And we've got to get the wisdom of God to know what to do so we can conquer that temptation in our life. Verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, when it talks about a double-minded man, this is actually the Greek word disukos. Di means to, sukos is the word from soul. So this is a two-souled man, as Jung's literal brings out the actual rendering of it. And what does that mean? Well, that means we're not set on the word of God. We're wavering. We've been tossed like a wave. We're two-souled. We might be believing one minute, but then in doubt in the next minute. We might be you know, giving place to the temptation, yielding to it in some manner. We're obviously not single-minded on the Word of God. If we're two-souled, it says we're unstable. Unstable, that means you and I are not spiritually stable in, this, in the attack that's come against us. We need spiritual stability in our life if we're going to grow up and become mighty and entering into all God has and be a part of this glorious, perfected church. We're going to be strong. We're going to be mighty. We're going to overcome and conquer everything. So we cannot be unstable in all of our ways. So it's important that here that we understand this is, what, this is an attack of, the te of temptation against you, trying to get you out of faith. And if you conquer it, you will be perfect and complete in, in, in everything. You'll overcome every situation. You'll show forth the fact that you are stable and you're one sold in line with the Word of God. And we come down to verse 12. He's still talking about temptation here. And he says, Blessed is the man that endures the temptation. 
That means he is steadfast and remaining firm in the midst of that attack. Four, then it says, when he is tried, this is not a good translation. The reason is because the word for is a Greek word that means because. Because. And when he is tried, <clears throat> this is really talking with two Greek words behind this phrase. You can see it below. <clears throat> Here's the word dokamos. That means to be accepted or to be approved. And the other word you see below that is the word ginomai, which means to become. This is what the Greek says, actually. So, and when it talks about become, this is a participle. So the way you would translate this, as Young's brings it out, because becoming approved. Why would we be approved? because we have stood steadfast against the temptation. We've remained, and we haven't given place to that in our life. So blessed is the man that's been enduring the temptation, because becoming approved, what good is that going to be for us? Look what it says. He shall receive or take hold of the crown of life. Well, that's quite a statement. That means if we're not being approved, if we're being overcome by the temptation, are we going to be able to take hold of the crown of life? No. And notice what it says, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. This is a promise. God's promises we can take hold of when we're in faith. If we're yielding to temptation and sin, we're not going to be able to take hold of anything. And when he talks about to those that love him, who are the ones that love him in Scripture? the ones that keep his commandments and keep his sayings and do what his word says. So, this is important for us, not only to go on to perfection, to be perfect and complete in everything, but also to come to the place of being able to take hold of the crown of life. This is important for us to conquer temptation in our life. Then he goes on in verse 13 and he says this, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Talking about with evil. God doesn't bring evil against us. Who brings the evil against us? The devil does. Trying to get us to sin so that then we'll, of course, get out of faith, yield to the enemy, let him come into our life and bring destruction. And at the same time, we won't be doing what God wants us to do. <coughs> we go on to verse 14. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. Now, that means that's coming from the lust of the flesh. Remember, sin dwells in the flesh. And it will work through lust or strong desires. Now, we must make sure that we're not yielding to the lust of the flesh. That's why we're to deny ourselves. We're to take up our cross daily, crucifying the flesh. So if we're drawn away of our own lust and then we get enticed or we're, more, we're caught, that means we've been deceived and we've been caught. This means to, to, to be beguiled, to be enticed, to be caught. So if we've been deceived and we've been caught because of the lust of the flesh, instead of walking in line with the word of God, we're going to be brought into bondage. And of course, what happens, what's the result of that? When lust hath conceived because we've yielded to it, it brings forth sin. Will we be walking in his ways when we walk in sin? No. And sin, when it's finished, it will bring forth death. You don't want sin to be working against you. It'll bring death and destruction in your life. He goes on in verse 16 and he says, Do not err. This is the word which really means to go astray or be deceived. Young's brings it out, led astray. Do not err or led astray or be deceived, my beloved brethren, because God wants you to go on to perfection. He wants you to overcome. He doesn't want you to give place to the devil. He wants you to be approved before God so you can take hold of the crown of life and you can be victorious. That's why this is very important. So he starts off here in James talking about dealing successfully with temptations that would come against us. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift or perfecting gift. See, everything that God brings to us is going to be pointed towards bringing us to perfection, to walk in victory in our life. It's from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God, everything that he brings for you, it's a good thing. 
and it is a perfecting gift that is going to accomplish his work in your life for you to come to the place of being the perfect man that we've talked about in many places we've seen. Verse 18, he says, Of his own will begat he us, or he gave birth to us, with the word of truth. How has God done everything in our life? It began with the word of truth. We got received the word. We got born again. We should be a kind of the first fruits of his creatures. So now, through the word, that's how God's going to do everything in your life. That's how you're going to conquer. That's how you're going to overcome. That's how you're going to be able to stand against all the temptations that come against you. Then he begins to talk about things that we need to correct and make sure we haven't made given place to the enemy on. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath or get angry. We need to be quick to hear, quick to hear, swift to hear, instead of just reacting to things. Slow to speak, instead of just blurting out things that we shouldn't be saying, maybe contrary to what's in line with the word. And slow to wrath, slow to get angry about things. Now, that's in the flesh. Anger is a work of the flesh. We're certainly not going to be going to perfection and walk in his ways if we're yielding to that. He goes on and says in verse 20, For the wrath or the anger, this means, of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And what are you and I to become? The righteousness of God by doing the word of righteousness so that we have the fruits of righteousness that produces holiness in our lives so we will go on to perfection. Now, the, the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. We cannot be yielding to the flesh. <coughs> Those people that get angry, those people that are yielding to any of the works of the flesh, they're not going to be righteous because it doesn't work the righteousness of God. Instead, it works sin in your life and it brings you to the place of giving place to the enemy in your life and bring you into bondage. Verse 21, so he says, wherefore lay apart, put off, put aside, put away all this filthiness, anything that's defiling, dishonoring, all these works of the flesh, Put it off. And the superfluity or the abundance of naughtiness, or this means anything that is of ill will, anything that is evil, everything that's not of God needs to be put away, put aside, get rid of it all. And receive with meekness the engrafted word. Because what's going to change you? The word of God. What, how is God going to work in your life? We've seen it time and time again. It's through the word in you, isn't it? As the word comes into you and then you hear and do it, then God accomplishes his work in your life. So we're going to receive with meekness, this is a teachableness, a receptiveness to it, the engrafted word. The engrafted word is a word which means implanted. Where is it implanted? We talked about it and we talked the last time on Hebrews. It's implanted in our heart. It's implanted in our mind. The word in your heart produces faith. The word in your mind produces hope and our mind gets renewed so we think correctly. Notice what this implanted word is do, will do. It is able or has the power, this means. It's from the word dunamis, it's dunamai. Dunamis is the word for power. It has the power to save, restore, rescue your soul. Where's the battleground? With the soul. So where's the enemy been working at you? Try to get you to yield to the so things in the soulless realm. Like getting angry. You choose to act on that with your will or in reacting to an attitude, emotions. That's all in the soul realm. So therefore, he's talking about how we're going to go on to perfection, but we've got to deal with all these things of the flesh. We've got to get the word in us. We've got to lay apart all these things that are not of him. And as the word comes into us, which has the power to save our soul, does it automatically do that? No, not unless we incorporate it into our lifestyle. And that's what he comes to next. He says, but be, the word be actually is the word ginemai, which means to become. And when it says become, this is actually a command to you and me. Because this is, as you see, an imperative mood. There's tense voice and mood of verbs, and this is the imperative mood, and imperative mood is a command, the mood of command. So you and I are being commanded to become. 
And because it's a present tense, the present tense in the Greek means continuous, repeated, ongoing action, not just once in a while, continually. So it's commanding you and me to continually become doers of the word. And that's because you do it, you hear it and do it, you hear and do it, you hear and do it, it gets incorporated into your lifestyle. He wants every one of us to become, and we're commanded continually to be, doers of the word, not hearers only. What happens if you're not doing the word you hear? You deceive your own self. Why? Because you have it incorporated into your lifestyle, it won't produce any fruit, and the devil will come to try to take the word out of your heart, remember. And if you don't do it, he will get it out of your heart, because you, obviously if you're not doing the word, you must be doing something else. And he goes on and talks about the fact that the guy that's a hearer only, what happens to him? Verse 23. If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass, or this really means a mirror. Like he saw himself in the mirror. It's likened to this. He beholds himself. He goes his way. He goes away. Straightway forgets what manner of man he was. He's saying if you're just a hearer only, you will forget what you had seen. Because, you know, he's looking in the mirror. He sees himself. Now he forgets who he was. Meaning you'll forget the word. The only way you will keep the word in you is by doing it, incorporating it into your lifestyle. So he goes on and says, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. And when it says to look, this is someone who looks carefully, inspects it curiously, he spends time in the word, not just casually. You don't just read a scripture and then forget about it. No. You get that word in you and you, you understand what it's saying. You incorporate it into your lifestyle. You look and make sure you're understanding what that word is saying. And notice, what are we doing? We're looking into the perfect law of liberty. Oh, that's the New Testament word. The law of Christ. In the New Testament, it's a law of liberty that will bring liberty for you in your life. And notice, it's a perfecting law. How are we going to come to perfection? It's through the law of liberty, the New Testament word. The New Testament laws, commandments of Jesus Christ, as you and I are looking into it and incorporated into our lifestyle and continuing in it. Well, that means you're doing it. You're not a hearer only. You're doing this word. He, being not a forgetful hearer who forgets it, no, he's a doer of this work, this man will be blessed in his doing, actually, and performing of it. That tells you something. Blessings don't come just because you heard something and you have a knowledge of something. It becomes you do the word and you walk in it. He that doeth truth comes to the light and his, deed, his deeds will be shown to be of God and he'll be blessed. The blessings of God come on those who are doers of the word. So we must become a doer of the word what happens if you don't? If you're here only, you forget what manner of man, you'll end up walking in sin. The devil will take the word out of your heart. It won't produce the salvation in your souls, the power of God to change your soul. And we'll end up seeing the destruction of the enemy come in our life. And we will not go on to perfection. He's dealing with a lot of things, as you'll see through James. He comes to verse 26. He says, If any man seem, among you seems to be religious, this is not a bad statement. Of, some people think religion is a bad word, you know, just like it means nothing. It's like being just religious-minded. No, this is actually a word which means someone who has the fear of God and worshiping Him and, and submitting to Him. If you think that you're, you know, I'm really a worshiper of God, I'm really walking in the fear of the Lord, I'm a true, genuine Christian, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, the man's religion is vain. That's quite a statement. It means he doesn't bridle his tongue. That means he just speaks whatever he wants instead of speaking in line with a word. That's a problem. What does it say? He deceives his own heart. Why would that be? Because what you speak, not only does it go out to people who are hearing it, but it also is heard on the inside of you. It's being sown in your heart at the same time. That's why you hear differently what you're speaking as opposed to if your voice was coming across on a tape recorder, you sound a little different, don't you? You're hearing it from not only an outside, but also on the inside. 
because the word is sown in your heart and actually what you speak with your tongue will either put right things in your heart or it can deceive your heart. Well, if your heart's being deceived by speaking wrong things, are you going to be going on to perfection? Are you going to be mighty? Are you going to be a part of this glorious church? No. In fact, this is quite a statement. It says the man's religion is vain. This is a word which means devoid of force, devoid of any success or result. It's useless and of no purpose. It's just like you're just, you know, going through the motions. You're not seeing the power of God. You're not seeing God do anything in your life. Well, that tells us another thing, and he'll be addressing this quite often as we go. Your tongue is important. If you're going to go on to perfection, we need to be speaking right words. We must bridle our tongue. Then he says in verse 27, Pure religion and undefiled before God, that which is clean and pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, means we're reaching out to minister to people in need, and also to keep himself unspotted from the world. The Bible says we're not to be conformed to this world. In fact, we're not even supposed to walk in the ways of the world. The Bible says over in 1 John 2 that all that's in the world is not of the Father. <laughs> it's of the enemy, the devil, who's the God of this age and the ruler of this world. So you and I are to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. What does that tell you? If you're walking in the ways of the world, you're spotted. Well, that means you're defiled in some way. Remember, Jesus coming back for a church without spot, without wrinkle, we're going to be contaminated if we are walking in the ways of the world. That's why we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're going to minister to people out there, but we're not going to walk in worldly ways. If we walk after the ways of the world, you are spotted. God wants you to keep yourself unspotted from the world. We come to chapter 2, verse 1. Brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. We can't have respect to persons. Respect to persons means I'm going to treat one person one way and then I'm going to go and treat another person a different way even though there's no reason for me to treat them any different. It's not like they, they're doing something that I should withdraw from them if they're walking in sin. I'm kind of preferring one over another and there's no reason for it. That's wrong. We should be treating everybody the same. We shouldn't have just treat certain people a certain way and then other people, usually people who have done that because they're, they get some, something good from the person that they are treating in a good way, some favor or some blessing, and the other person, well, they can't do anything for me, so I'll treat them differently. No, that's wrong. That's sin. Well, you and I are to have no respect to persons. We're to treat everybody in line with the Word of God at all times, and that's important. We come down to verse 5. He says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? We saw that phrase before. To them that love him. And who are the ones that love him again? The ones who are keeping his commandments and doing what he says. And that's because they're walking in the commandments, especially the law of love. He comes to verse 8, and he says, If you fulfill... Or this is really the word which is a form of the word which refers to about perfection because it talks about, this is the word teleo, it comes from the word where it comes to perfection, to bring something to a completion or, perf or perfection. If you are perfecting and completing the royal law according to the scripture, which what's that? That's the law of love. The royal law is the law of kings. It belongs to kings. You and I are kings. And what is that? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. God expects us to walk in love towards everybody. Agape love is a love that realizes the valuableness, the preciousness, and the importance of an individual. That's what he expects. But then he goes on and says, if you have respect to persons, well, that means you wouldn't be walking and treating everybody in love the way you should. You commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. You're a lawbreaker. Therefore, we got to make sure if we're going to go on to perfection, be a part of this mighty, glorious church, 
that we're not having the respect to persons. We're going to be treating everybody correctly in line with the Word of God. And then he comes down to verse 12. So speak ye, we already saw about speaking correctly, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Otherwise, the word that we've been given, if we do it, we're going to be blessed. But if we don't do it, or we do contrary to it, we are going to be judged. So when it talks about speaking here, this is you continually speaking, present tense, and it is a commanding statement, imperative mood. He's commanding you and me to continually be speaking, and we're also commanded to be continually doing Imperative mood, present tense, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. That means the things you speak and the things you do are important. Certainly, if you're going to be a part of this glorious, mighty, perfected church, we've got to learn to speak right things. And we've got to learn to do the Word of God consistently in our life. He goes on and says, because it talks about being judged by the law of liberty, for he shall have judgment without mercy that showed no mercy. Well, the person who wouldn't show mercy, that's the person that's treating someone different from the other or doing evil things to a person. We're going to have judgment without a mercy if we haven't shown mercy. Remember, it says, blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy because we're reaching out and showing mercy to others. Mercy rejoices against judgment, and that's what we want <coughs> because we are not going to um, be ones who don't show mercy. Now he comes to another subject, and this involves your faith, which we've already seen, where our faith is to be right if we're going to be a part of this glorious, perfected church. Remember, one of the foundational principles back in Hebrews was faith towards God. So we need to make sure we're operating in faith. He goes in verse 14, he says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? In other words, is faith something that you just, as an attitude of mine, or I just believe something? No, it's more than that. It also has works, actions upon it, doing what the Word says. And of course, can faith save him? The answer to this is no. If a brother, he gives an example here, if a brother or sister be naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, Notwithstanding you give them not those things that are needful for the body, what does it profit? Well, you could have done something and you didn't do any works to minister to their needs. Even so, he's comparing this, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. That's important. That means faith is not just something that's alone, I just believe. No, if I have faith, I'm going to be acting on the word, Works are going to show forth your faith. If, it's, if a faith is, doesn't have works, it's dead. It's not doing anything. Being alone. He says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, which you can't. I will show thee my faith by my works. Anyway, otherwise, your works show where your faith is, because that's what you're doing. That's what you're acting upon. That's why when God sees what we're like, he says, I know thy works, the judgment coming on the church in Revelation 2 and 3. The first thing he says to them all is, I know thy works, I know thy works. Your works are what's important. So, your works show forth your faith. <clears throat> Example, let's say in getting born again. You can believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid the price for your sin, made the way for you to be born again and get a new spirit. Well, that's great that you believe. But if you don't receive him, which is your work of believing by receiving him, are you going to get born again? Are you going to get a new spirit? No. Your work is acting on the word to receive him, because it says as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. In other words, just believing doesn't get it done there has to be corresponding works acting upon it. He goes on, he says, in verse uh, 20 now we come to, Wilt thou know, O vain man, or this again, is a person who is called devoid of truth. It's kind of saying, hey, you should have known this, but you devoid of truth man, 
Faith without works is dead. Many people say, I've heard it many times, say, well, I'm believing God to heal me. Well, that's saying a, word, a statement of faith, isn't it? I'm believing God to heal me. Well, that doesn't produce it, though, does it? You've got to have some works. Well, if you are believing that God's going to heal you, what are you doing in order to see healing come into your body? Are you praying to receive healing? Or are you doing, acting on the word in some capacity? Or casting out the spirits to get rid of those spirits of infirmity? You see, believing is one thing. And that produces faith as you believe in the heart. But you need to be working your faith. <clears throat> faith without works is dead. Look what he says now. He gives an example. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? He had to go and act the performance. Of course, he was given provided the lamb instead as a, instead of him, which is all pointing towards Jesus, the lamb who was going to be given for us. But he had to go up there and he had him laying on the altar, remember, and, and had the knife ready to, to carry through with the, the offering of Isaac. Seeing thou how faith working together, this word ra is a word that means working together, how faith working together and this means something that was ongoing. It's an imperfect tense, which means past tense, but it was ongoing action in the past. So how faith, which was working together with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Well, that tells us something. Our faith is to be perfected. That's part of us coming to the place of being the the mighty, perfected, glorious church. Our faith is to be perfected. So, by works was faith made perfect. He had to have the works to bring the perfecting of his faith so it would produce results. Scriptures fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, it was imputed to him for righteous, he was called the friend of God. That's right. It wasn't just him believing God only, though. He had to act on the word and work his faith. Verse 24 is important. You see then how that by, man, by works a man is justified. Now he brings it over to something else. The word justified is the word which means rendered righteous or declared righteous. Well, what is the prevailing teaching that we hear out in the body of Christ today? That by faith alone you are saved or you are justified and made righteous. Look what this says. You see how works a man is justified and not by faith only or alone. The teaching that says that we are saved or we are rendered righteous by faith alone is a lie. It's one of the biggest teachings that we hear in the body of Christ out there from all these different ones. It's false. You have to have works combined to be justified. Because how do, you, how, does, how do you see your faith? Your faith shown by your actions and your works. You can't just say, I believe, and then you don't do what the Word says. No. See, that's why hearing produces faith, but doing is the works. We need to be doing what the Word says. We go on and says, here's another example. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, declared righteous by her works when she'd received the messengers and sent them out another way. She did a, something that was necessary to show that forth. Then he comes to here. He says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. If our body doesn't have the spirit in it, it's dead because what's the life of the body? The spirit. Well, faith doesn't have works, it's dead also because what's the life of faith? Works. Works is the life of faith, not just having faith alone. So we know that by works is a man justified, not by faith alone, and that faith working together will cause our faith to be perfected, to be made perfect, which is going to be important because we're going to go on into perfection, and our faith is to grow, and we're going to walk by faith. Remember when Jesus comes back in Luke 8, he said, shall, he find, shall the Son of Man find faith on the earth? 
And that shows whether you're really following the Lord and walking in His ways. Then we come to chapter 3. He says, My brethren, be not many masters. The word masters is actually the word teachers. And when it says be, this is the word ginemai again, become. And so when he says this, this is actually a command. It's a command, do not become, present tense, many teachers. Well, who should be a teacher? Only one who's called of God and has a ministry gift of a teacher. There's many people that just want to go out and they want to become teachers. If you're not called of God and you don't have the ministry gift from Him and have actually done what's necessary to be able to teach accurately and effectively, uh, you're making a mistake. Be knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. That's right. Those that are teachers in the body of Christ need to be called, they need to be uh, equipped. Uh, certainly, if we don't know the Greek and the Hebrew, and we don't know the tense voice and mood, as you, we bring out all the time, and study all the scriptures, are we going to be effective as a teacher? No, we could be teaching all kinds of things that are error if we don't know, bring out this forth. That's why he says, become not many teachers. And a lot of times people want to be a teacher, and they got no business being a teacher if they haven't been called of God, and especially if they haven't learned what's necessary to be a teacher. Because we're going to, anybody that's teaching the Word, they are under the greater judgment if they don't teach things that are accurate. I recognized that long ago. I cannot make mistakes. I have to look up every scripture. I have to look up the voice, t tense, mood, learn these things, and bring forth accurately what is being said and hold nothing back. Verse 2, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, this really means speech here talking about what he says. If we offend not in speech, the same's a perfect man. Ah, here's another aspect of going on perfection. Notice what we said before in the beginning, the guy who conquers the temptation by being steadfast, he'll be perfect and complete. The guy who is walking in the ways of walking in love, he's going to be one that's going to be perfect before the Lord. This guy that's watching what he says in his words, his speech, he's going to be a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. That's why our speech is so important. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. That's quite a statement. That means that little bit in that horse's mouth controls the direction that he's going. Well, our tongue controls the direction that you and I are going. Behold also the ships, though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds. Yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. The big ship has got that little rudder on the back. Whichever way you turn it is the way the thing goes. A little member, and that's why he comes to verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member. It's directing where we're going. That's why we've got to make sure that we're only speaking right words. He says, boast great matters. Behold, how great a matter a little fire will kindle. It'll set things on fire if you speak wrong words. He goes on in verse 6. He says, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. This is the word adikia, which means unrighteousness. That means your tongue can be a something which releases unrighteousness. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles. It'll defile us. The whole body. And sets on fire, as here, when it says sets on fire, this is, it ignites the course of nature. And it's interesting. This word course actually means a wheel. Things start turning like a wheel of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. Otherwise, it sets on, starts things rolling in a destructive means for sets on fire of hell. It's going to start seeing the destructive work of the enemy come in our life. We go down to verse 8. The tongue can no man. Now, this is the word anthropos, which means a human being, meaning in your own ability, you cannot 
can tr tame this tongue. Who can tame the tongue? God can. How? Through the word in you. When the word gets in you, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. But if you don't have the word in you, you'll be speaking from the flesh, from the human nature, and you'll be speaking all kinds of wrong things. Now, notice it's an unruly evil. Why? Because there's evil dwells in the flesh, full of deadly poison. That's why we just can't go speaking whatever we want. And what's the key? So you speak right, having the word in you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will be speaking. You'll be speaking forth what the word says. And of course, you're supposed to think what the word says as your mind is renewed as well. You'll be thinking, oh, I'm going to say this. I'm not just going to speak whatever I want. Remember, we saw we're to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, as we saw. We think about what we say. He goes on in verse 9, he says, Where, Therewith bless we God, even the Father. Yeah, we're speaking good things to the Father. Therewith curse we men, which are made at the similitude of God. Oh, well, that's someone that's speaking evil things to a person or about a, against a person. We can't be speaking evil things against a person whatsoever. No, we're to speak blessing. He said, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. I mean, I can't be sp speaking blessing one minute and then cursing someone and speaking negatives, you know, against them the next minute. We need to be speaking right words. So here's another thing that's important if we're going to go on to be perfection, because remember what it said back here in verse 2. If we don't offend in speech, ah, that's a perfect man. If you're not, you and I are going to go on, we're going to learn to speak right things, and the key will be getting the word in you and then thinking about what you're saying, not just saying whatever you want to say. Verse 13. <clears throat> Who is a wise man? That's what we want to be. And then it says, endued with knowledge. This is an interesting word in the Greek. Notice what it means. It's only used one time. It means one having the knowledge of an expert. That's what God wants. He wants us to get us the knowledge, get the knowledge of God like an expert. And why would that be? Because we're doing it. We have we're put in an operation. That's why it also implies the reason we get to this place is because of being experienced in it. We have the knowledge of an expert. How does someone become an expert in anything? They get the knowledge and they do it and they put it in operation and become an expert by being experienced in doing something. Well, that's what we have to do. That's how you get wisdom, of course, hearing and doing the word. It's going to be an expert among you. That's what you and I are to be. We're going to grow up in the things of the knowledge of God and walk in his ways. Let him show or give evidence out of a good conversation. Now, this is a word not talking about just talk. In the Greek, it's a word that means your manner of life, your conduct, your behavior, everything about you. Let him show or give evidence and proof out of a good manner of life, conduct, and behavior his works with meekness of wisdom. Otherwise, he's showing forth that he has wisdom. And remember, the guy who has wisdom is going to be the one who's going to be a perfect man. He's going to possess the promises. He's the one that's going to be one who has the knowledge of an expert. He's experienced in the things of God. And he's going to be showing this, uh, this manner of life, conduct, and behavior of the Lord coming out of him. That's what God wants for us. At the same time, he says, you've got to get rid of this. If you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, eh, that's not good. Glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above. It didn't come from God for you to be envious or in strife. But earthly, sensual, and devilish. It's of the devil and it's coming from the senses. This really is a form of this word, sukakos, suke which really refers to that which is of the, the natural realm operating through the senses. Well, it's earthly. Are we supposed to walk according to the ways of earth? No. We're to seek the things above and operate according to heaven because we're citizens of heaven. We're not to be operating, letting the devil operate through us. That's what happens if you have envy and strife in your heart. Uh, you're give, you've given place to the devil. We can't have that. Where envying and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. Oh, that means the devil's really come in. 
Make sure you don't have problems in relationships with people. You should not have any envy or strife or any of these kind of things. In fact, it's interesting. The word confusion really means instability and a state of disorder. Here, we're totally out of order. We're out of sync. We're, we're in instability spiritually. and We're dis in disorder because we're not right with God whatsoever. And every evil work, that means the devil can come in and cause all kinds of problems. Mental problems, emotional problems, financial problems, hindrances, blockages, all kinds of destructive things. That's why we got to make sure we're walking right at all times. The wisdom that's from above, which is what we're to walk by, it's first pure. Something that's pure is going to be something that is holy, because there's two words here, and this is the word, meaning it's pure, it's clean, it's that which is free from fault, it would be holy before God. It's peaceable, because we're going to be ministering peace to people. Blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, they're, they're going to be ones that are going to be right with God. <coughs> gentle, fair, mild, gentle. Easy to be entreated or easily obeying. Full of mercy and good fruits. That's the way we treat people with all these things, see? Without partiality, meaning that we're not going to be having respect to persons. We're without partiality. Without hypocrisy. We don't act one way one minute and then turn around and act another way another time. We'll be nice to the person because we get something and then later we're going to be a totally different way. That's a hypocrite. No, we can't do that. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Or as Young's brings it out from the word order standpoint, the fruit of righteousness in peace, which is what it produces, is sown to those making peace. God wants you to make peace. He didn't want you to have envy or strife. So this is all talking about relationships. Your relationship should be right. You should not allow yourself to be an envy or strife. You should be one who is walking in peace with others. If not, you're in a state of disorder and, and every evil work can come into you. Now he brings up another. See, he's pointing out all these things that have to be corrected if we're going to be a part of this mighty, glorious, perfect church, the perfected church. James 4.1, <clears throat> he says, Whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war on your members? Remember that the lusts are operating in our body and the lust of the flesh, but they also will work in our members. That's why we got to make sure that we're getting our mind renewed and we're not just yielding ourselves because your members, which is all part of the flesh, will want to do things that are wrong. They want to hear things, want to see things, want to uh, walk in ways that are sinful in the ways of the world. They're warring in your members. These are all your faculties, what you see, what you hear, what you think, uh, what you're putting your hands to. No, we cannot allow that. That's why you got to guard your eyes. You got to guard your mind. You got to guard your tongue. That's another member. You got to guard what you're hearing. You know, got to guard these kind of things because the lusts will try to work at you for through this. So he goes on and says, <clears throat> "You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have. You cannot obtain. You fight and war." It says, you have not because you asked not. They weren't even getting the promises because they were not iteo, making a demand of what's due them. And when they did make a demand of what's due them, but their lusts were running them, you make a demand of what's due you, this is this Greek word, and lombano, receive not. Why? Because you're making a demand of what's due you, same Greek word, amiss. It means you're doing it wrong. Why? that you may consume it upon your own lusts. His whole point is, if you're being run by your lusts, you're not going to be right with God whatsoever. These lusts are worn in your members, and you're having all these lustful desires, but even if you're praying, if you have a lustful motivation, desire, you're going to consume it on your own lusts. I'm going to pray for a million dollars so I can go buy all the things that I want, you know, consume it on your own lusts. Now, if you've needed it for ministry or something, that'd be different. But if it's all for me kind of a thing, that's wrong. Otherwise, your motivation is important. Now he comes to another thing, he says, because he just dealt with the lusts in the members and the flesh. Now he's talking about 
not being someone who is a friend of the world. And he calls them adulterers and adulteresses. See, we've been called out of the world. We're not of this world. We cannot be walking in the ways of the world. He says, you adulterers and adulteresses, spiritually he's talking about, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. The word enmity means hostility and hatred with God. And we can't be walking in the ways of the world. Whosoever, therefore, who will be <clears throat> a friend of the world is, not is, but this is a word, he has actually set himself, he has set and um, shown, declared and shown himself to be, in this sense, the enemy of God. In other words, if you're a friend of the world, because you're walking in the ways of the world, you've actually shown yourself to be an enemy against God. You've set yourself as an enemy against God. That's why he speaks to them as adulterers and adulteresses, because he's, he's talking about these people that were doing things of the world. That's another point. He wants you separate from the world. How can you be a part of the glorious, perfected, mighty church if you're walking in the ways of the world? No, all that's in the world is not of the Father. We're to be separate from these things. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're going to minister to people in the world, but we're not going to walk in worldly ways. It's amazing how many Christians are, have one foot supposedly in God, and then they do all these other worldly things, and they wonder why they're not walking right. And it's not good whatsoever. Verse 6. Here's another thing he addresses. He addresses pride and says the fact that we must be humble. He gives more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, and gives grace unto the humble. Pride will hinder you, of course, from being right with God. It's sin. And if you will have pride, are you going to be a part of the glorious, mighty, perfected church? No way. We've got to be humble before the Lord. Humble are those who are submitted unto God. We see it in verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That's someone who's humble. They've submitted themselves. The word submit actually means to arrange yourself under or subordinate yourself or to subject yourself. Put yourself in subjection to God. Be submissive and yielded unto Him. And it also refers to being obedient. If you're going to be subject to Him, you're going to obey Him. How would you show you're submissive to Him and yielded and humble? Because you obey everything He tells you to do. Then what do you do in regards to the devil? You don't obey anything He tells you to do. You resist the devil and he will flee from you. Anything from the devil, you resist it. You don't want to give place to it for one minute. And then he tells us what we should do. Draw an eye to God, he'll draw an eye to you. Does God automatically draw an eye to us if we don't draw an eye to him? No. We have to, our, our, what's first? You and I draw an eye to God. What will be the result? Then he will draw an eye to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Get rid of all the sin out of your life. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. This is the same word we've seen before, disukos, which really means two-souled. Remember, if we're two-souled, we're unstable, and I can't receive anything from the Lord in all of our ways. We're unstable. And so that tells you what else will double-mindedness do, or two-souled. It'll cause an impurity in your heart. Your heart won't be right before God. That means it's not just having a good intent with your heart. If you have two soul, it affects you because whatever's in your, all your faculties, including your mind and will, it's coming into your heart. And your heart will not be pure if you are double-minded. So he's staying here, draw an eye to God. Get rid of all the sin and get your heart pure before him by being single-minded on the word and not double-minded, not two soul. Then we come back to verse 10 again, and he talks more about this humility. It's interesting when it says, humble yourself. It's not actually correct according to the Greek. This is the word. And the reason I say it, because if it said, humble yourself, that means it would be an active voice. You're supposed to do it. Look what it is. It is a passive voice. That means... The active voice means the subject's doing the action. 
If it's a passive voice, it means the subject's being acted by, on by somebody else. Well, who's the subject? You and I. You. Be humbled, since it's happening by somebody else, in the sight of the Lord. So who's going to be doing this? God. And it's an imperative mood, so it's a command to us. So he's essentially saying, you be humbled by God in the, in the sight of the Lord. Otherwise, you've got to let God have his way. And he, of course, will humble you under the mighty hand of the Lord as you walk in line. How? Because you submit to his word. You put his word first place. You subject yourself unto him. And then what will happen? He shall lift you up or he will exalt you. Many people wanted to be, wonder why God hadn't exalted them. Well, it's the reason because they haven't been humbled by God in his sight. Well, how do I get humbled by God in his sight? Certainly, I put away pride. I submit myself to him. I put the word first place, and the power of God comes into me, and God's working now in my life to bring me to the place of walking in his ways and doing what he expects. Then he will exalt you. And many people thought, oh, if I just humbled myself, I wonder why I had exalted me, because it's not talking about you doing it. It's talking about God doing it. Yet it's a command, and that's because you submit to him. Then we come back to about your tongue again. And this is so important. He says, verse 11, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. And if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. He doesn't want us to speak evil of our brethren. What should we be doing? Speaking words that are going to encourage them. Even if they're walking wrong, we want to call them to repentance. And... What else do we do? We want to pray for them. We want to be praying for them that God will be working in their life. Then we come down to verse 14. Whereas know ye not what shall be on the morrow? For what is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Well, that tells us something. If our life is like a little time and then vanishes away, then we need to make sure we're making use of our time. Don't waste your time. Redeem your time, other scriptures talk about in, like in Ephesians. We should be making sure that, that we are putting our life in line with the way of the Lord and not wasting our time whatsoever. That's why it goes on and says, for you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Because I want what God's will is. I want God, what God wants so I can see him working in my life. Not that I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. Make all of your time count because you're submitting unto the Lord of whatever he would want you to do. And of course, this is implying that you submitted to him because it's a subjunctive mood. Meaning, if the Lord may will, because I'm submitting to him as I met that condition, then we're going to live and do this or that. Then I won't be wasting my time. I'll be doing good things that God wants me to do. And then he's still dealing with his pride when he says, now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Uh, any braggart, any talk about the I, 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 me, 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 that's all evil. He doesn't want you to be doing that. Verse 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. That's quite a statement. If you are knowing to do what is good, what is right in God's sight, and you don't do it, well, that's a guy he's heard, but he's not doing. It's sin. Because, of course, he's deceived himself. This means that sin is not just something that I committed that was bad. In this case, it's a sin that I didn't, but something I didn't do, which would be a sin of omission as opposed to a sin of commission. In other words, if I don't do what the Word says, it's still sin. I knew to do good, but I didn't do it. So it's a sin of omission that I didn't obey the Word. Because God expects us to hear the Word and do it and not just ignore it or omit it. We come to chapter 5, and we see more things that he's correcting them on. He says, Your gold and silver's canker, the rest of them shall be a witness against you. You'll eat your flesh as it were fire. You've heaped treasure together for the last days. And what were these people doing? You've lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Oh, they just wanted to live luxuriously. That's all they cared about. They weren't doing what God wanted them to do whatsoever. You've nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. We cannot be 
living for ourselves. No, we need to be living unto him and doing what God wants us to do. Then we come to verse 7, and he brings another thing that's important. Be patient. This is a Greek word, makrothumia, which means long-suffering. Long-suffering. We're to be long-suffering in every situation, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. This is the parousia, the second coming of Jesus. Behold, the husband waits for the precious food of the earth, and he has long patience, makrothumia, long-suffering for it, until he receives the early and latter rain. We're to be long-suffering in the face of whatever's going on in the world, whatever situation we might be dealing with, because we're going to be carrying out whatever God wants us to do in the ministry, reaching people to bring them to the place of coming to be born again. God's long-suffering. We should be long-suffering. Hear it again. He says, Be ye also long-suffering. Macrothumia. Establish your heart. Get your heart stable. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So we need to established or set fast our heart because our heart's got to be right before the Lord. He also tells us, grudge not one against another. Don't have grudges, holding grudges against someone lest you be condemned or we'll be judged. We got to always walk in love, always have right attitudes against another. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. And then he comes back to this about long-suffering. Take my brethren, the prophets, who spoke in the name of the Lord, example of suffering affliction and of long-suffering. Didn't matter what's going on. And we know there's going to be persecution down the road. Be long-suffering in the midst of whatever comes against you. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience or the steadfastness of Job, have seen the end of the Lord. He's very pitiful and of tender mercy. He, so he says we should be, that's the way we should be in whatever we're doing. He also tells us, above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any oath, let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. You don't need to give all these explanations because people want to try to get you to do it. Give your yes, yes, or your no. If you want to give an explanation, fine, but don't, you're not under obligation to. You don't have to explain why you don't want to do something. Just say yes or no, otherwise you fall into condemnation. Then we come to verse 14 and 15, talking about healing. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. God wants us to be healed. The prayer of faith shall save and heal the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And then it says another interesting thing after that. If he may be, not, there's this word have is not correct, because it's the word may be in the subjunctive mood. If he may be in the state that he's in, sick, having committed sins. This is a participle. The way you translate a participle is having been something. And because it's a perfect tense, which means a past tense with effects at the time of speaking, what this is saying is, and if he may be in the state he's in, sick, having committed sins in the past with present effects now. What does that mean? Well, that would tell you like demons came into you from past sin and now you're in the state because of what came into you from your past sins. Can, can you do something about it? Yeah, God will forgive you. Those shall be forgiven him. God will forgive you of those past sins and you can be healed and delivered from the sins that caused you to be sick in the past. And we know that's where deliverance comes in because the inherited generational, especially curses or things from our own life, we can cast out those demons and take hold of healing and get set free from those bondages. So we can be healed of everything, not just what we have now, but anything from the effects of the past. And he wants that to happen in our life. He goes on and says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. And he wants to make sure that we're, we don't have attitudes towards people. Any faults, any sin areas, and you need to make it right with someone, make it right. Pray for one another. You may be healed. Then he says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. 
or releases mighty strength and force. It does, much. Because you're going to learn to pray as a righteous one. Who's the righteous one? One who's right with God, hearing and doing the word, walking in righteousness. And we're going to pray effectively in line with the word of God. As you pray effectively, it will bring forth mighty force to see people be set free. See, God wants you to be a prayer warrior for him. He wants you to pray effectively. He wants you to release mighty force to impact people's lives, to see them come to the place of being set free and perfected and a part of the glorious church. Verse 17. Elias was a man to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Three and a half years it didn't rain. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Well, what's this got to do with end times? Well, we can see the same thing happen again, because in Revelation chapter 11, it talks about the two witnesses. Remember what it says about the two witnesses that are going to be preaching the gospel? If any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. They have authority means to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. They can shut heaven. It's going to be quite a time when these things are happening. And they have authority over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. These are when judgments are going to be coming on the nations that are going to be coming against the God and coming against the things that he is doing. And then the witnesses are going to be dealing successfully against all of these attacks. It's going to happen again. We come to the one last passage of Scripture in James. We see so many things that are brought forth to become a part of this glorious church. Verse 19, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, which is what we should be doing. We don't condemn people. We want to see them get converted and come to repentance. Let them know that he which converts the sinner from the error of the way shall save a soul from death. That's what we want. We want to save people from death and end up in hell and shall hide a multitude of sins. These are things that are brought forth in the book of James that are important. And what do we see? It talks about many sins, just in summary. Temptations to sin, being led astray, deceived by sin, by walking in the lusts of the flesh, anger, words of our mouth, being a friend of the world, have respect to persons, get into envy and, and strife and with people, pride. These are all things that are going to bring curses on us. Praying to get things to consume it, on, consume it on your own lusts, not being submissive under authority to God, not cleansed from sinful ways, double-minded where you're unstable, wavering, speaking against others, slandering them and speaking in negative ways, being a braggart and prideful, not doing what you know to do is right, which means sins of commission, grumbling, complaining against people and confess, you know, confessing sins towards others or continue to be in sin, any of these things, or walking in sin, that's going to bring destruction. At the same time, he reveals a lot of things that are important for this end-time church. Remember it said, count it all joy? That means people rejoicing spirit regardless of what comes at you. Steadfast in the soul to overcome temptations. Get wisdom as you pray for wisdom. God will give you wisdom to show you what to do in any situation. Your faith is to be operating and it will have works to perfect it. You're going to be, as you pass the test and conquer the temptations, you'll be able to take hold of the crown of life. And you will be shown to be righteous, remember, before the Lord. As you walk in line with the law of love, that's the royal law that everyone must follow. We're also to get the knowledge of God as an expert and become doers of the word that we hear. So we enter in and see the blessings. We must be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, because that does not work the righteousness of God. We're to be unspotted from the world. We must be humble. We must get cleansed and purify ourselves. Make all of your time count and don't waste your time. Be long-suffering and get your heart established correctly. Pray to release mighty power for others and learn to speak and do 
because we're all going to be judged by the law of liberty. Those are things he wants established in it. If we get those established in us, then we will be a part of this mighty, perfected, glorious church. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that brings revelation of things I must eliminate and things that must be established in my life as I put away all these areas of sin and conquer temptations and walk in line with the word of God. And as I bring forth these principles that are necessary to see me be righteous and walk by faith and overcome all temptations and be cleansed and purified before the Lord and humble before him as I do what all these things say and speak and do as one judged by the law of liberty, I will have established a mighty, perfected, glorious church. I'll be a part of that because I will be a hearer and a doer of the word. Father, I thank you. I'm putting the word of God in operation in my life. I will be a doer of it. And I will conquer anything and everything that is not of the Lord. Because I realize I must be a part of this glorious, perfected, mighty end time church. And it will happen because of me doing the word. You will accomplish this work in my life. So I commit to be a hearer and a doer of your word. Thank you for bringing forth the mighty, perfected, glorious church work in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. So many things that are covered in James that need to be corrected. Our mouth, all, mouth, all these different things, but also things that need to be established. As you get them corrected and you get things established, you'll see God accomplish the great work. Father, thank you. We're going to be hearers and doers of this word, and we will see the mighty work accomplished from being a doer of your word that you will bring us to be that perfected, glorious church. And we will be ready for the coming of the Lord to be presented as the holy one, the ones that are without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, holy before you at the coming of the Lord. Thank you for much fruit as we hear and do this word in Jesus' name.